the universe is filled with codes. What I'm interested in is helping people find the codes and then begin to activate and generate and to bring them up in such a way that yes, you find that you are not the encapsulated bag of skin, but you are the whole cosmos in itself. Hi, everybody. Miriam Williamson here, and welcome. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. We're going to be talking about the inner life. There's a lot of talk about how much we have to change the world now. We're all aware of the various stress points environmentally, racially, societally, on so many levels. Things clearly need to transform. But people are also beginning to have a deeper understanding of the internal dimensions of societal change. Something's very wrong inside us that things could have gotten as bad as they are outside. And that has to do with moral dimensions. It has to do with psychological and spiritual and emotional dimensions. When I was in college, I used to have these huge posters on my wall, and they were of these angels. And I just didn't know much about them. I just thought they were these beautiful paintings of you know, tall angels. Many years later, I was walking down the street in New York City. I was on Fifth Avenue, and I was passing the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in front of the Met, there are often these huge flags that contain pictures um, of whatever particular exhibit they're showing at the time. And I saw these huge angels that I had had on my wall when I was in college. And I saw that, in fact, they were paintings by Edward Burne Jones, uh, a Scottish painter. Uh, I had known his name. I mean, that was on the poster, but I didn't know anything beyond that. I went in uh, to see the exhibit, and I did one of those things where you can listen on your headphones to um, information about the painter and about the paintings. And I learned something that was particularly interesting to me at the time, because I was writing my book, Healing the Soul of America, and I was reading a lot about uh, the transcendentalists. I was reading about the effects on the Industrial Revolution, um, uh, on British society, on our American society. And these paintings had a lot to do with that because Edwin Burne Jones was one of the artists in Britain, just as there were uh, artists and philosophers in America who were doing the same thing, warning uh, Western civilization of a great risk that we were taking by turning our attention so much outwardly that we were going to lose something on the inside, that there was an imbalance that was occurring within the psyche of people and that this would have terrible repercussions in our outer world. And there was a line from Burne Jones where he actually said, and this was behind these angel paintings, he said, every time they build a machine, I will paint an angel. I thought that was so extraordinary that he was saying that he would do everything he could do to keep aloft in the consciousness of people that what is going on inside us is as important as what's going on outside. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution, uh, uh, modern humanity's eyes were definitely turned outward to some extraordinary things, obviously, including extraordinary uh, benefits that came from both uh, the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. At the same time, I think we're all beginning to recognize that something has been lost, some imbalance has occurred, and it's a deadly imbalance. We have lost our sense of reverence. We've lost our sense of the sacred. We've lost our sense of devotion. We've lost our sense of the mythic. And this has uh, led to terribly irresponsible behavior on our part towards the earth, towards each other, and even towards ourselves. My guest today is not only a pioneer, she was one of the primary teachers when it came to the um, entire field of personal transformation that began to burst forth in, beginning in the 1960s and in the 1970s. It is said in the metaphysical tradition that the last 25 years of every century sees a, a, a bursting forth of this kind of information. So my guest is Jean Houston, the author, the researcher, the philosopher in the area of human capacities. Um, my favorite thing about Jean Houston uh, that, uh, that I find the most mind-blowing is not only that she's such a seminal thinker, that she's 
a teacher of the teachers, that she has written over 25 books. Uh, but listen to these two things. First of all, the Buckminster Fuller, no less than Buckminster Fuller, once said, Jean Houston's mind should be considered a national treasure. And also, a book that she wrote in 1972 with her late husband was called Mind Games. And drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, no less than John Lennon said, it's the best book I have ever read. I can't possibly overestimate the effect, the influence that it has been uh, on my career to have read so much of Jean Houston, to have learned so much from her. And I think that so many of the people who are working in the field of uh, futurism, who are working in the field of personal and even societal transformation are probably affected uh, by her work in more ways than they know because so many of her ideas and so much of her information has made its way into the popular culture. So, what were our mythic beginnings? What was going on in ancient history? What did the ancients know that we forgot in ways that have been, uh, been very deleterious uh, to our civilization? Where are we now? And how do we transform and to become what Jean Houston calls the possible human, the future human? Uh, all that's happening in the world today is a reflection of who we are now. So if something's really off in the world, it's because something's really off in us. And no one can describe better what needs to change in us than my guest, Jean Houston. And make sure that you hang around after the, um, the conversation that we have, uh, because I will be taking a question. Uh, so uh, you know how that Ask Marianne thing goes. Uh, feel free to send in your questions to Marianne at castmedia.com. And now, my conversation with the inimitable Jean Houston. My friend, my colleague, my sister, Jean Houston, thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, thank you so much, dear friend. You are one who does not bore God. Thank you very much. That's a, and neither do you. Uh, be, before you came on, Jean, I, I quoted Buckminster Fuller saying that your mind was a national treasure. Um, I, I quoted John Lennon saying that Mind Games was his favorite book. But what fascinates me most about you is not only that the greats of the past, such as Bucky and John Lennon, have, have celebrated your work, but how many young people are rediscovering the extraordinary genius of Gene Houston? You give not only a holistic view in terms of our inner world, but also in terms of history. So many of the things that you have talked about have to do with stories, myths, philosophers that go all the way back many, many years. So what I really want to talk about today is kind of everything. I think you said you have a course, Everything 101A. So um, really what I want to do is just uh, open up the space for you to tell us where has humanity been? Where are mm -hmm. we now? And of course, the, the greatest significance of your work, where are we going? What is the future human? What are the changes that we have to make in order to survive? I look at our time, and as something of a cultural historian, I look at similar times, like the late 14th century or the 6th century Tang Dynasty. But take, take the European, what happened? You had a terrible plague, a great pandemic that took out half the population of Europe, but was followed by the Renaissance in Italian, rinascita, rinascita, rebirth. And it's as if times of horrendous catharsis, not just in terms of the body, but of the mind, of the spirit. I mean, the Catholic Church was falling apart at that time too, if you remember. Um, this catharsis- I don't really remember, but- That's all right, you know. You're, I'm just joking. Your higher self remembers everything. But what happened was then followed by a whole radical change in perspective. I think of Leonardo da Vinci, who writes a monograph about how to get 3D in paintings, you know, and he shows how to, you know, add a little sh shadow here, a little darkness there. But the whole change in perspective shifted everything so that you have perspective in terms of the telescope, you know, Galileo, uh, uh, many others. You have the microscope, Leeuwenhoek. You have a whole new sense of way of buildings can be built, Michelangelo. You have the flow of the blood supply. You have I mean, just about everything shifted in terms of seeing the dimensionality of things. 
And I believe that that is where we are now. We are in a radical state of approaching dimensionality, especially with who and what we are and what we contain within ourselves. Perspective and dimensionality. So what is the perspective? What is the new perspective? What is the broader perspective? And what is the dimensionality that is available to us now coming out mm -hmm. of this global pandemic? Well, I believe it is, <laughs> it, it's, it's people waking up to the fact that we are fractals of the universe, that we don't just live in the universe. The universe lives in us. We are not an, an encapsulated bag of skin dragging around a dreary little ego. We are an organism within the great unity, the great oneness. Now, whether you call that God or the unified field, it is, it's those are words just grappling, <laughs> yearning to try to figure out how can, what can I call you? What can I call you? The universe says, <laughs> here I am. And that here I amness is within ourselves. As you know, I've spent a lifetime, I've been in 109 countries working in 40 cultures, and I've spent a lifetime trying to tap into the great field of the human capacity. Why is it that some people can, you know, do as you did? I remember you, may, may I speak of you a little bit? No. But yeah. I remember you so many years ago and, and what you did for the AIDS people with, with finding food for everybody, from doing what people were not doing. That's perspective. That's saying, what do people really need? What is it that is trying to enter into time? And then you found uh, the, the Course in Miracles, I remember and you were there. I, I knew Helen, by the way, but that's another story. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait a minute, because some people, uh, some people who are listening right now would be very fascinated by the fact that you knew Helen. Helen Shookman, for those of you who don't know, was the woman who received the material, what she called interdictation, uh, that, uh, that was the birth of, of the Course in Miracles, the, the writing of the Course in Miracles. Jean, I worked in the office uh, as a, uh, of, of the Foundation for Inner Peace, but Helen didn't want to see any of the people who were involved with that, so whenever she was coming over, Bob Scotch would make me leave, because um, yeah. Helen's coming over today. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who would love to hear uh, your memories of Helen. Well, she was rough. She was gruff. She was a you know, a, a nice Jewish girl from, uh, from the Bronx, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was un the most unlikely person that you could ever know to write A Course in Miracles. What happened was dimensionality. Perspective right. opened up in her from how we do not know, but it was there. And the lady who was speaking about, well, I don't know, where is this coming from? You know, it's not really me, but, but it was her. It was her at a different dimension. And she was mm -hmm. a genius of psychology, of theology, and of a whole sense of the glory of the human relationship to the great oneness. I mean, the, in, the ingenuity, the ingenious ways that she, that she or whoever it was in her deeper perspective that came through could say the things that she said with such uh, uh, a kind of potent, uh, punctuated aliveness and correctness. That was extraordinary. Whereas the everyday person was really rather different. Um, but the, uh, she was a Renaissance woman. I just realized that she really was. Something else got born in her in spite of what anything that we knew about her before. What was your experience of her? Well, because I didn't actually get to meet her, of course, but I'm very aware of the story. And I think a lot of people don't realize that she was a clinical psychology professor at yeah. Columbia University. Yeah. And one of the things I love about it is that she was writing this material between 1965 and 1971, which yeah. is exactly, around, she was just around the corner from the hotbed of the uh, student revolution of the 1960s at Law Library, at Law Library at Columbia University. So at the same time that all that was happening, yeah. she uh, was receiving the dictation uh, of A Course in Miracles. And after she died, although I didn't get to meet her, I did have dinner uh, once with her husband, with her widower, and he said, so, 
I hear you like my wife's book. <laughs> I don't think you'd ever read it, but that's it. So oh, I hear you like my, my wife's book. Okay, so I know you've known many in incredible people. Um, so so let's go back to this. Too much sugar than she was. Yeah. <laughs> so you're yeah. talking about... Uh, you were talking about dimension and perspective, and you were talking about how there was a parallel between what happened after the uh, the plague in Europe, the bubonic plague, yes. and what is happening now, and yes. how a period of, of a plague and contraction like this can be followed by rebirth. And you were yes. saying that there is a parallel between the fact that a new perspective, a new dimensionality emerged then, a new perspective and dimensionality is uh, is appearing now. Where do you see it now? And what is it now? I think it is a much easier relationship to the domains of spirit, of evolution, of a kind of radical creativity. I see it particularly in young people. I know a lot of mm -hmm. young people. And I am astonished. Not only what young people in their teens or 20s are saying, but the seven-year-olds, <laughs> the seven- and eight-year-old kids are amazing. They seem uh -huh. to know it all. Have you, have you noticed that too? Uh -huh. and, and yeah, the, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But it's, it's as if uh, a, a new tide is, has, is flowing in and in the tide, we understand as I said, you know, we're, that we are fractals of the universe. We have access to the same things that the universe knows. We are, um, we, we have another kind of energy field so at the same time that the old world is really cracking and breaking down and doing all kinds of uh, strange flip-flops, uh, something else is coming in. And it comes in, I, I find it particularly, with the very old and the very young. You know, Me too. One... I'm like, that's exactly how I feel. I want to talk to older people. I want to talk to younger people. It's the people in between who are, who are so bought in to, this, to the illusions and the bullshit and the, like... I know, but if you're old or young, come on over. I'm, I'm so with you. I see that. Yeah. So let me tell you a story about this. what happened to me in this book. So I'm sitting there typing away, and I'm really bored with what I'm writing. And my big 150-pound dog goes to a corner of my bedroom and begins to paw, paw madly at, at a rug and will not stop. And occasionally we'll look at me. And then it goes back to falling. Well, I go to where he is, and I notice there's a little, so it looks like a slip of paper. And I pull the rug back, and it's actually a whole scientific paper on the nature of uh, the future, that past, present, and future are simultaneous in the great cosmic unity. And it is such a brilliant paper that I look at the name, and the name is Anna Louise Smitsman, who is in Holland. And I immediately get in touch with her. And she said, do you know how long I've been trying to reach you? You see, well, I get hundreds of emails a day. So often the best ones go by the board. Anyway, we get to talking and we realize that we together could do something really maybe even important on understanding not only the time that we're in, but what happens when you change your perspective and realize that you are a cosmic agent wearing a biodegradable space-time suit. And that if you shift, <laughs> you shift that perspective. So hold on, hold on, I, I want to repeat that. A, a cosmic agent wearing a biodegradable think tank biodegradable suit. Okay, everybody, that's who we are, right. <laughs> that's who we are. And that we have a book to tell, a book to say, we have never met. She lives on the island of Mauritius, thousands, tens of thousands of miles away. And I'm in where I am in Oregon. And for the last year and a half, for hours every day on FaceTime, we work. And uh, she, I, I discover her to be the female Einstein. That's the only way I could. And she sees something useful in me, I gather. And the story is a real story. And it's, uh, well, Anna Louise caught the COVID. And she had all kinds of extraordinary experiences of seeing the way the universe works while in the COVID state, and then came through it, thank God. Uh, and so there she is on the Mauritius Island. She's, she's a uh, full-time mother of two young boys. She is the head of all kinds of organizations, especially ones that 
are trying to bring in a new economics, a new sociology. So she's she's enormously brilliant and has also, like me, has a certain amount of know-how on quantum physics. So we've, we've worked away and we we actually wrote the whole thing, but it was too much of a download. So we're turning it in English now so that people will enjoy it and going to be teaching courses on it. But what it is about ta- using, using the vehicle of a story, it is about how this young 25-year-old woman gets over the COVID and suddenly in, in, in the whole process, the universe is revealed in a huge mystical experience of the way it works. And that we are, as I said, agents of the cosmos who have forgotten our perspective and who and what we really are. Now, what you had, I believe, in the Course of Miracles was this turning away of the sheathings of forgetfulness to remember the power of who we are, that we live in interdependent co-arising with God, the universe, you know, the whole thing made in the image and likeness of God. Well, what we do is we study the image and likeness of what the cosmos is, and we realize that we have the same patterns within ourselves. And how you begin to retune to those patterns gives you totally different, or well, maybe not totally different, but, but substantially uh, original ways of working with the, the the traumas of our time, from COVID to certain people whose names we don't mention, but who I met once. <laughs> um, Einstein, of course, Einstein's favorite, uh, famous quote that you, we will not be able to solve the problems of the world from the level of thinking that we were at when we created them. There is this sense, there's a new kind of thinking that is necessary in order to give birth to a world that is even sustainable over the next hundred years. And also when you talked about time and the multidimensionality of time, um, uh, Einstein said that time and space are illusions, albeit illusions of consciousness, he said, albeit persistent ones. So this idea, as you said, pulling back, the, of course it's three dimensions, but the idea that our, yeah. our perceptual mechanisms can go beyond just these three dimensions into planes of understanding that are just as real, just as important, and even necessary in order to take us into the new time that is Very possible. Much so. Very much. So. Right. Yeah. You know that I met Einstein. I told you that, didn't you? You knew that. You when met I Einstein? Eight, when I was eight years old, I went to PS6, where they took us to meet the great elders of the time. Helen Keller was one. Einstein was another. We were trotted across uh, the river to uh, Princeton. We sat down in a room with a big board filled with equations. And this funny old man comes in. You know, he has a lot of hair, seems a little vague. He has a red sock on and a blue sock. Yeah, <laughs> what is your questions? <laughs> so these smart aleck kids, one raises a hand and says, oh, Mr. Einstein, how can I get to be as smart as you? He said, mm, read fairy tales. We did not like that answer at all. So another smart aleck kid <laughs> answers, Mr. Einstein, how could we get to be smarter than you? Ah, read more fairy tales. Well, I got a chance to go off to the side and talk to him for a few minutes. I said, Mr. Einstein, not professor or doctor, but Mr. Einstein, uh, you're talking about the imagination, aren't you? Yeah, you got it, my child. Imagination. Everybody thinks I'm so brilliant at mathematics. (laughs) My students do all that work. I'm a very poor mathematician, but I have a great imagination. I ride the, the beam of light. I go through the cosmos. I understand. Imagination, that's where it is. Now, well, he was famous for saying that the imagination was more important uh, than data, <laughs> than what we think of as intelligence, etc. That's just so amazing that he said that to you. You know, when I was a little girl, one of my friends, uh, her father had gone to Princeton, and her mother was working while her father was in college, and she was working as, a, as an assistant in the office to Einstein when he came to Princeton. And the way mm-hmm. she talked about him, he was just this kind of absent-minded old guy she didn't like seem to get. We said, you worked with Einstein. And she's like, yeah, you know, she didn't like get that uh, this was all that important a thing, even though she knew intellectually. So Einstein himself told you when you were a child, no less, yes. that um, imagination is 
is the most important thing. And of course, the whole idea of fairy tales. It seems to me that fairy tales were, uh, they're, they're so endlessly profound. Of course, Carl Jung worked with them a lot, Bruno Bettelheim. It, it's true that there is so much deep information in the fairy tales that uh, relate to that kind of interdimensionality that you're talking about here. But you see, what we are in the process of now is finding a new mythic narrative. It's not there yet. It, I a mean, new I, mythic narrative. Narrative, yes. And, uh, you know, I used to have terrible fights with Joseph Campbell. We did a lot of work together. And he would talk about the hero's journey. And when I talked about the heroine's journey, he said, no, 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 it doesn't exist. I said, you are so wrong. And then he said, well, Jean, you're right. <laughs> and in my own small way, I've been trying to... Um, there are great differences, by the way, between the heroes. And I just heroes. have to stop you for a second and yeah. make note. You know, this is such the this is the treasure, everybody, all you youngins. This is the treasure of having us elders among you, if I may say so. That Jean just said, how many people do you know who would say not only that she met Einstein and that he told her to read fairy tales, but she also just said, I used to have terrible fights with Joseph Campbell. Now, how many people can say they even had a conversation with Joseph Campbell, much less terrible fights with Joseph Campbell? That's extraordinary, Jean. And you just said that you told him that it's not just the hero's journey, it's the heroine's journey. Tell me about that. Well, you know, he had, uh, he looked at how many, it was like over 200 societies to try to determine what is the nature of the hero's journey, and it's pretty good. Of course. But it lacks things. I mean, you can take something as simple as, it's the Wizard of Oz. What does she do? She dreams big. She yearns. Her yearning is so big, the universe has to respond to her. Yearning is the first part of it. Not, oh, I wish, not that kind of laziness. It's, yes, I have to go over. I have to leave Kansas and get over the rainbow. And I, it's so huge that it has to happen. And then what does she do? She meets the disempowered ones. The scarecrow, who thinks he doesn't have a brain. The tin man, who thinks he doesn't have a heart. The cowardly lion, who's just afraid of everything. And she says, well, come with me. This is something the hero does not do, the heroine does. Let's have the journey together and learn from each other. And of course, it proves that the brightest one of them all is the, uh, the scarecrow. The one with most empathy is the tin man and the one who has the least fear and does incredibly courageous things is the, tower, is the lion. So that is a major part of the heroine's journey. You invite, you bring along, you do not project onto them, you become a family. And in the heroine's journey, they're creating these families of the unlikely and often the unseen who then become extraordinary beings because the heroine has seen them. That's, that's one of the biggest differences of all, and it makes all the difference in the new narrative, which is happening now. It's so interesting that you say it all begins with yearning, because I've thought about that in terms of sex and the birth of children. I mean, it's sexual desire. It is a, it's, a, it's a yearning that leads to the conception of children. I mean, I think that's so amazing. We don't intellectually formulate, and that's where children come from. But there is desire. There is... I yes. always thought that was amazing. Also, I was thinking about um, <laughs> the Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz recently. I was thinking if they wrote it today, they would be the Republicans would be those that don't have a soul, and the Democrats would be those that don't have a spine. We have to find the whole person and the whole institution, right? Well, look, let's, you brought up the birth image. Let's just go further with it. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing that for you to happen, for me to happen, it begins like at a tiny little dot the fertilized egg, it's a little tiny dot. And from this dot, which is coded, which is loaded with so much information that then can uh, reassign itself through the whole structure that create the entire body-mind system, that comes from a dot, a code. Well, the fact is, the universe is filled with codes. What I'm interested in is helping people find the codes and then begin to activate and generate and to bring them up in such a way that yes, you find that you are not the encapsulated bag of skin, but you are the whole cosmos in itself. One of the things that, you know, as you know, I've done all my life is help 
unlikely people to become luminous, transcendent people uh, to the degree that I can, with some failures, but not many. And it's also that unveiling, that activation of the growth potential of the cold, which is as great in us for spirit, for philosophy, for pragmatism, for making a world work as what happens from the little dot that we started from. We are Okay, well so let's go back a little bit. I read an art, I was reading an article, I want to talk for a moment about sperms and eggs. And I was reading an article about how when the sperm uh, gets towards the egg, that they have now found with the microscopes that, that the egg actually reaches up to meet the sperm. Yes. And also, um, we have a real problem on the planet because of how much sperm apparently is not, uh, not uh, uh, swimming towards the egg uh, within the human race, within the species the way it has. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing all kinds of weird things happen where they're swimming in circles, obviously, as an, as an expression of the fact that something is wrong. We're not birthing yes. uh, the way we, way we need to. So then you go on and you talk about the coding. Just like every acorn is already coated with what it takes to become an oak tree, the bud is coated to become the blossom. And we're, of course, as you said, within this dot, DNA, et cetera, where we are coded physically to become the adult bodies that we are. But what you're talking about here is that we're also coded spiritually, correct? And that's, of course, has been your great work. I myself have been a recipient of that activation that one gets when we listen to you, when we read your books. Tell us about that activation and that coding that lies within each and every one of us. Well, we are spirit in flesh. We are soul forces. We are we come in <laughs> coded with godedness. And you know, the, the, the beautiful things about some of the new science is that we literally are part of the universe. We have everything the universe has. When you look at genius, and I've studied a few geniuses in my time, we find that they have they go into the place of discovery to find their codes, we're often with imageries, sensory images, uh, food images, smell images, the full sensory sensorium. You know, I sometimes talk about my old friend who lived with us the last few years of her life, Margaret Mead, the anthropologist. Mm -hmm. You know, she used to, she was very short and I'm quite tall. And she would look up at me and she said, you're just like me. And I would say to her, Margaret, I'm not at all like you. You are much smarter than I am, and I am much nicer than you are, <laughs> which, was, which was true. But anyway, Margaret, uh, the, the fascinating thing about Margaret is that she was fascinated by her, about herself. And she would go into the dimensions of herself. She would really feel this with using all her senses so that this, she entered what, what Jung referred to as the imaginal realm. Now, what is the imaginal realm? You might start with imagination. I want to see what it tastes like, what it, what it smells like, how it feels, and it, it would become a living. The idea that she was pursuing would be, and this is with also people that I teach, it would become a living embodiment of your senses, and friends, from that you would go into your, your more mental states. So this embodiment then is you had created, you have fertilized the code within yourself by using the plenum of, of human prescience, human rich, rich, rich creative structures that lie especially within the sensorium. Um, from that, it's as if an interdependent co-arising with the universe, the universe says, hot dog, we got a live one there. <laughs> and the universe opens up its shuttered portals to be enter into a kind of co-respondence and co-creation. We are gifted to be co-creators. I would watch Margaret be a co-creator. And also something else about Margaret I'd like to talk about. Um, she was not what you would call good looking. She had a, a pleasant face. You knew her. So you, you, you know, used to go. I didn't know her personally, but of course we all know her famous quote, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. In fact, that's the only yeah. thing that ever has. Ever has. She said that on my couch. <laughs> Just said that. I said, Margaret, write that down, put that out there. That's really it. Um, well, I think she said a small group of concerned citizens, right? Yes. Never doubt yes. that a small group of concerned citizens concerned, can yeah. change the world. In fact, that's it's right. the only thing that ever has. 
yeah. And that, and she then she said, and then on her deathbed she said, "You go out and you do it. Set up teaching learning communities. Get the concern, which in my small way I've tried to do." Um, not in just in your small way and your big way and you've done it and I'm sure she's yeah. very pleased with you Go I on. hope so. <laughs> all right so here is the story um, we were working with this handsome handsome young man together 24 years old Alex and I found I found him just sitting in so bereft I said Alex what's the matter oh Jean I'm so deeply in love I said you're in love Alex who are you in love with? And oh no, no, I first said, is she your age? Uh-uh. Is she a little <laughs> older than you? Mm -hmm. 10 years older? Mm -hmm. 20 years old? Mm -hmm. but who is it? <laughs> it's Margaret Mead. I'm desperately in love with Margaret Mead. I immediately go over to Margaret and I said, Margaret, do you realize the beautiful, beautiful young Alex is madly in love with you? Of course he is. Everybody is. <laughs> what is that? It's very simple. I am bread to them. They are wine to me. Wait, wait. Have you, Jean, you were so, you know, you remind me of Jean Houston. Wait a minute. I, I, I've got to write this down. They are bread. To, I am wine to them. They are bread to me. What did you say? They are wine to me. I am bread to them. They are wine to me. Yes. And how old was she when she said that? She was 76. And Alex was 24. I don't know what happened after that. Probably not much. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see, she lived in that state of utter delight in everything. I never saw anybody eat with so much gusto, not even my Sicilian relatives who, who were mythic in that way. But she would eat. She would uh interact she would argue and everything became alive because she was so alive and thus she, the people she was wined <laughs> wherever she went now she had a gusto for life that was really remarkable and the reason i bring this up is because that's something that many of us lack isn't it but she really believed that she was part of the living cosmos and that she had everything and knew everything. She had all the gifts that she that she could possibly even when she would bring in people to share the gifts and make them cup and, and, and if she didn't like their draining running on, she said, Oh, sh do be quiet, you're boring. That was her worst epithet. You are boring. You are not interesting me, interesting God, you know, and, and people would then rise to the occasion. My father mm -hmm. had that gusto. My father yeah. was one of those magical characters, and he uh, he used to call it having a spirit of adventure. You gotta have a spirit of adventure, and this idea of genius and studying genius. You know, Jane, in the Course in Miracles, it says that those who have achieved the most in this world have achieved a fraction of what all of us are capable of. And it's okay. not an accident. I think people, I think we're on the verge of a great societal realization. And it's already starting in some places that there is nothing in the air, nothing in the sun, nothing in the um, earth, nothing in any natural external uh, power source that we know that can even begin to uh, to carry with it the potency to transform this world compared to the human brain. And also, we're, we're learning so much, Jane, about the brain of children before even the age of five. Yes. When 80% yes. of the brain development, that's why I feel so strongly we need to move so much of our resources. We need to front end them uh, into the minds of small children. We are just letting so much gold just slip through our fingers by not doing more to actualize the brain of small children. And I also think part of this that's very, very interesting is psychedelics are back. It's so interesting. I'm sure you know all about that with Michael Pollan and Rick yeah. Doblin. Isn't it interesting that neuroscience and psychedelics, there is this sense of people, that, don't you think that's part of the multidimensionality that people are looking into now? Yes, and part of the new world? The new and I started that whole movement, as you probably know, the psychedelic, the varieties of psychedelic experience, you know, which we wrote. And Wait a we, minute. Now, you knew that. About well, me. I knew how much a part of all of that you were. I didn't know specifically of your writing about uh, psychedelic experiences, but I certainly uh, knew that you were one of the great voices that emerged yeah. from that period of time. I would like to, I'd like to take this to, yes. I mean, so everything is rising up 
to bring us yeah, back all coming back to what we really are, which the psychedelics yeah. were one. But I think equal to that, well, let, let me ask you, um, I know that you are God in hiding, and often not so in hiding either. You keep peeking through. <laughs> but as but I want you to rethink of yourself as the universe being contained within you. Can you do that? And that you contain all the imaginal, you contain all the imaginal qualities. What is the imaginal? It is not imagination. It's way deeper than mm -hmm. imagination. It is the actual way in which we find our source code in the universe's immensity of knowledge and, and uh, sentience. Okay, so I'm going to challenge you with this. I want you just to do this. Wait a minute, this is, this is a good one, all right? Okay. And you are that, and you can feel yourself okay. be that, and you know that. Okay. Now, from that state, look at the world, not as a complainer, no, no kvetching, but, but look no at the world. No whining, as my father would say. No what? No whining, he used to say, no, no whining. whining. Yeah. Yeah, no whining. But from that, look from that perspective, knowing that you and engaging others can make the great shift, the renaissance. What are you going to do to help create this renaissance out of this broken society? Begin. You're speaking from this larger beingness. That's you and the universe in an imaginal, meaning an incredibly co-creative relationship. I don't know the form that my work will take in the future, but I have long been dedicated to the process of which you speak, and I have tried my best as a person in my private life as well as my uh, professional life to do that. Uh, I've never, <clears throat> I've never uh, fully actualized that potential within myself, but I have long known that the journey and the effort is all that really matters. You were talking earlier about the imaginal cells, the imaginal dimension, and I love, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, I first heard from Deepak about the, the way that the caterpillar disintegrates into an imaginal soup yes. filled with imaginal cells, and, the, and out right. of that, the butterfly emerges, and it's so clear to me that that's where we are as a species right now. Everything is just disintegrating. We are in this apparent chaos that's really this imaginal soup, right? And as each yes. of us, I mean, I would assume that you would agree with me that the individual coding uh, that, that lives in all of us, that exists in all of us, is how we might best be midwives to the emergence of this, this new world, correct? Uh, midwives, but also exemplars of it, allowing it to happen within us, allowing this out of the soup, the imaginal cells of the new creation coming together within one's psyche and also within one's body, mind, you know. When you think, when you think of our environmental problems, uh, the climate crisis, uh, when you think of the assaults uh, that have occurred and the obvious uh, risks to American democracy and to democracy around the world, uh, when you think of the racial problems here and the problems between and among peoples, so many places, increased militarism, including on the part of the United mm -hmm. States, almost in sp especially on the part of the United States, uh, nuclear bombs, et cetera. Do you ever fear, you know, you were talking earlier about these little ones who have so much wisdom that they're just clearly coming in with. Do you ever fear yeah. that we will uh, go too far, that we will go over the cliff before these young wise ones have a chance to take it from here? Well, I think it's not even going over a cliff. You go over the cliff and you find an, yourself climbing another cliff and you go over that one. We are in the time of an incredible acceleration of cliffs, aren't we? And of course, the problem is that with uh, social media and everything else that comes at us, we are bombarded with the, with the, chronic, the, the, the chronic aspect of bad news. Now, this then inhibits the creative factors within ourselves doesn't it? Mm. And this is why we need, and you, you've done so well in your life with this, of, of creating communities of practice that are really looking at the depths and the, the, the depths, and yes, the dangers, but also the enormous gifts that have come with the phenomenon called being human. Mm. And not just looking at big masses of people doing terrible things to each other. So that's one thing that that I'm going to devote the rest of my life to, communities of practice, um, 
and not just of practice, but then going out and doing something about it. We need another model. We need another vision that tells us that it's okay. I look at the rising of new archetypes that are happening in our time. It's as if the heavens themselves are shaking and saying, we need to send in the angels or whatever you want to call them or the archetypes. I know that you have strong relationships to those. But I, we are not alone. We are part of a great cosmic happening. We have become in our body minds fertile. This is probably where the fertilization takes in. Our soul is pregnant with what is trying to come through. We are the womb keepers, men and women alike, women and men alike. We are the womb keepers who are nurturing this growing child of literally a new era. The old era not only is dying, it is mostly gone. It's just that we're seeing the, the residue, the detritus of its, of its, of its death remains. Uh, but something and, else. And the, and the imagination then is the womb out of which the new will be born. Yes, absolutely. That is the womb of becoming, the imagination, which then can contact its source codes in the imaginal, which is what it, is the mind of the universe. And, and there is, you feel that there's a particular, there, I think there is a particular activation going on right now, partly because we are all alert to the threat, we're all alert to the death throes of the old order, we recognize it, this sort of chronic assault of bad news, as you said. You know, the Course in Miracles says, look at the crucifixion, but do not dwell on it. If you don't look at what's wrong, you're not in transcendence, you're in denial. But if you look at it too much, you become sucked into it. So it's this balance, isn't it? It's like I was talking earlier about Edward Byrne Jones, the Scottish painter who said, every time they build a machine, I will paint an angel. That somehow we have to find that sweet spot uh, yes. between noting what's wrong enough to be intelligent participants and uh, analyzing what's wrong, but also give at least equal weight, if not twice as much weight, to the work that needs to be done to bring forth uh, the repair the alternative and the new future, right? Years ago, I had a conversation with Buckminster Fuller. I, went, I, I brought a complaint to him about something that had to do with education. He said, and I'll imitate what he sounded like, oh, Jane, don't waste your time being a geek. Build a better model. I think we, are, we need modelers who are co-creative with the immensity of designs that is all around us. We are new design engineers, but we don't have to go out and read a book to do it. We literally contain those new designs within ourselves. Do you find that there is a repetitive designing structure that keeps emerging in your mind these days? Of course I do, but I also know, Jean, and you and I both on a personal level, without going into details, you and I both on a very personal level know very well the resistance of the power structures in our society and, and in our world to the empowerment yes. of the new modelers. And I, I feel that in every area of stress, in every area of disintegration, the people who are articulating new ways, who are, articul are articulating uh, new ways of being, whether it has to do with agriculture, it has to do with the climate, it has to do with the inner dimensions or anything else, uh, I recognize um, not what only are they not funded. Be, or what do you see as the breakthrough events that are happening that sort of dismiss the, the, the deviant modelers or the deviant destroyers. What do you see? The only hope that I see is that more and more people are awakening to the game that's being played. Yes, I that's think I, I, I think even politically, I think that, and the issue is will it happen fast enough, but I think that people are waking up to ways in which they've been duped on every single mm -hmm. level uh, into believing that those who created the problem are going to fix it, that the systems which actually brought us so low are somehow capable of disrupting themselves. The status quo will not disrupt itself. But there's something very frightening about the change that is involved in going with, for a new way. You know, in the story of Moses, when Moses said to the Israelites, okay, Pharaoh said we can go. He said, get your people, get out of here. We can go. We got to go fast. The Israelites did not jump up and down for joy. They said, wait a minute. 
we're slaves now, but you want us to go to some promised land. You don't know where it is. We're going to go through the desert. The desert, Moses. We don't even know if we will, uh, if we will survive the desert. So I think that the resistance to change, just as we all have within us the coding for the new, I think we also have within us the resistance to the new, the fear of the new. You know, there's a line in The Course in Miracles where it says, some people would rather die than change their mind. And when you look how we are behaving on this planet, whether it has to do with climate change or income inequality or, or nuclear, nuclear power, we are risking global catastrophes in casual ways. So great is our resistance to actually turning the direction uh, 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 to, to fundam towards fundamental change. And I think clearly we understand that now, as was always thus, it has to do with tremendous political power, uh, tremendous technological power, business power, and e economic power that is arrayed uh, behind the more regressive forces. But when you ask me what is the chance that we have of breaking through, I think it's when enough of us as individuals understand what you were saying before. We have the universe inside us. And if there's yeah. enough of an awakening among people, it goes back to Margaret Mead. It's concerned citizens. Too many people think, oh, they have the power. Well, if you think they have the power, they have the power because you keep giving them the power. The more people look at the status quo and the prevailing economic and political systems and realize that, then we will turn a corner, but we have to do it fast. What does your daughter say about this? You know, it's interesting. My daughter certainly agrees with you and me uh, politically about things, Jean. But she lives in Europe. She's uh, been in London now for half her life. Yeah. And it's interesting. She, I, I think that living in the United States, even though she certainly identifies as an American, but there's a kind of chronic upset tension and sense of urgency that you feel being within the chaos that is the United States today that I think she sees without quite the... Um, uh, internal hysteria that you see among so many Americans. Yeah. And also, you know, she's 30 years old, she just got married, so she's at that beautiful stage of life where hope ar overrides all else. And I'm happy for her. But she's a smart, smart girl, and she also, yeah, she, she gets what's going on. That's why. You know, one of the saving graces of being human at this time is the discovery that we are not schizophrenic. We are polyphrenic. We have so many oh. different people within us, and we think that we're this, this narrow form. This came alive for me. As I used to know a very interesting actress by the name of Catherine Hepburn. Okay. And what she said to me one day is... I think people are just like, oh, she knew Catherine Hepburn too, did she? Okay, oh, go yeah, on. She said, she was really very interesting. She said, everybody thinks I'm Catherine Hepburn. I am not Catherine Hepburn. I am good old Yankee Kate. I scrub my own floors. I do the dishes. I take care of the gardens. I take care of all my friends. I am straight arrow, one, two, three, four, A, B, C. I, that's who I am. Catherine Hepburn is this creature, this creature who lives on my shoulder, who I have to pretend is fascinating, but that's not who I am. I'm good old Yankee Kate who knows how to get things done. And this was true. And this was true of her. When you, if you knew her private life, she was a doer. She was this, not this, you know, illustrious actress. She was someone who took care of her friends, who took care of the house, who scrubbed the floors. <laughs> and this is, and it really struck home to me, this was many years ago, because I realized that this is what we are. I find, for example, I hate to write. I hate it, hate it. And I have 35 published books and now another one coming along. How did I do it? Not by writing, but because I happen to be a very good cook. I'm a very good cook because my mother, Maria Nunziata Serafina Graziella Pirina, marries Jack Houston of Texas, and they hated each other's food. And so in order to keep them together, I became the world's first fusion cook, making chicken fried polenta or whatever it was, you know, to bring the thing. But I find that if I enter my, my extremely galloping chutzpah self of being a very good cook and bringing that good cook who, you know, finds all kinds of ingredients and picks up different kinds of spices to bring a tang to the whole, 
then I can cook, then I can write. You see, what are the other parts that we have within ourselves that are not addicted to the failure of the time, that are not caught up in the non-stop Ferris wheel of breakdown, but are, are the ones who are part of the leading principal actors within yourself of the breakthrough, the creative artists, the ones who do not have all, do not live shuddered by fear, but have a sense of joy and the glory of what it is can be. I believe that we are on the urge, not we're not there, but we're at the edge of, re of the Renaissance times. That's why I'm so glad we started out our conversation. Rinascita in Italian, the rebirthing. And we are great wombs that are holding the rebirthing. If we are going to have a great rebirth, a great renaissance, a large part of it, Jean Houston will be because of you. And when you talk about that gusto, I think it's that gusto that has been nullified. Too many people, their senses have been, have been dulled. There's a, there's a dulling of the spirit and of the senses and of so much in modern life. And I think it's almost like that cracking open of the cosmic egg that people are recognizing that they yeah. want to live. And also, I, I, I'm reminded of a term called, in sociology called the discontinuity of progress, that you never know where it's going to come from, sure. that yeah. when you look at the great moments of change, they could never be rationally predicted. Even you were talking about um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci before, that great gay vegetarian painter who changed the world. Um, he was, his mother was 14 years old. And she was a peasant girl. Her, his father was a mid-manager type of person who took a business trip and had a, an affair with a 14-year-old peasant girl. And um, Leonardo da Vinci. So that's certainly not a uh, celebration of you know, sex with a 14-year-old girl. His, but education, it is. his education was the, in the place where there was so much ferment and creativity that he could mm -hmm. absorb this. Mm -hmm. I want to see education as one of ferment and creativity, hands-on, hands-on, sensory-rich, speaking to the in, incredible depths of creativity that is, resides within each child. And then you have the stuff of the Renaissance, Rinascita. Well, Jean, as you've said, you've been to, what did you say, 190 countries? No, no, 109. How many? 109 countries. Uh, you have uh, worked on behalf of the United Nations. You have written 35 books. Uh, no one has seeded a new renaissance more than you. And I, I mean no that very, very sincerely. It's simply the case. And uh, whether it has to do with helping Hillary Clinton write her book, It Takes a Village, or any of us, including myself, who have read your books, who have been so, talk about activation. And I think when I one first talked to you on the phone, one what did you coming. say? One more book one is more coming. Is no, you mean after the trilogy, or, no, or you mean the, the new one? The trilogy. Future Humans. Future Humans, the quest of Rose. It'll be on Amazon in uh, late June. And it's really pretty good. Pretty good. I'm, I'm very pleased with myself. <laughs> with regard well, to you that. said that you co-wrote it with this woman that you think of as the female Einstein. Well, so um, how could it not be, uh, how could it not be pure it's Jean Houston in, in its brilliance? And it's about many of the things we talk about and how we come through them to the revelation that we are not alone, that we are, yes, we are geniuses, we are gods and goddesses wearing biodegradable space-time suits, and it's time to recognize that. In the Jewish Book of Wisdom in the Talmud, it says that over every blade of grass, there is an angel bent over saying, grow, grow, grow. 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 Yeah. Yes. God bless you, Jean. Thank you so much for talking to me. And uh, I'm sure that many people who are listening are finding your words as illuminating as ever. Thank you so much. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Thank you. Well, I hope that you enjoyed listening to Jean Houston. I cannot imagine that you didn't. Uh, how many people do you know who can say things like, well, when I was talking to Buckminster Fuller, or when I was talking to Albert Einstein, or when I was talking to Margaret Mead, um, 
what a what a wealth of not only information uh, does she have and memories, but extraordinary insight and illumination. Um, her books are amazing, and this newest one, remember, it's a trilogy called Future Humans. Um, I can't wait to dig in. Okay, and now we're doing our questions, um, and I have one here from a woman named Alyssa in Atlanta, Georgia, and she says, Dear Marianne, do you think humanity is getting better, or do you think humanity is getting worse? And my answer to that, of course, is very much in line with the things that Jean and I already talked about today. And the answer is both. There are two parallel phenomena occurring today. And uh, one is a world that is dying, a world that is a disintegrating, a world which is now organized, this human civilization organized according to economic principles, um, uh, political, geopolitical principles, um, social principles, which are literally unsustainable for the human race. And at the same time, there's something new being born. At the same time, uh, billions, I'm sure, of people are feeling this internal activation that, um, that Jean was talking about. One world is dying and another world is, we're pregnant with something. And I think, much as Jean and I were talking about today, I think that something happens in us when we recognize all that matters in the deepest sense if we really want lives of meaning and purpose, and I think that's what we're really yearning for, is to feel that our lives matter, to feel that our lives have a purpose. And that purpose is more than to make money or to accumulate things. Our purpose is to live lives that matter. And that is the same thing as saying live lives that we were intended to live. And that means to be part of the, uh, uh, of the rebirth of human civilization. You know, every cell in the human body its highest actualization is to collaborate with other cells for the healthy function of the organ and the organism of which they are part. That's what we're here to do, to collaborate with each other in creating and co-creating something much bigger than any of us individually. So when we do this, uh, we don't have to worry so much about what it's going to look like or exactly how that's going to work out. I think a lot of us get stuck there. I think the first thing is simply to say, I'm available. That's, that's the first thing is use me. There's an old gospel song, one of my favorite gospel songs, use me, whatever you call it, universe, God, source, whatever. Use me, use my hands, use my feet, use my talents, use my skills, use my past, use my success, use my failure. <laughs> I know that the insights and the lessons I've gotten from failures have been as great as the lessons and the insights I've gotten from what might be called success. Everything we've been through, uh, the only real failure in life is failing to learn from something. And all of us have had rich experiences, whether they were painful or they were happy. Uh, most of us, if we honor ourselves enough to acknowledge it, have been through layers of experience that deserve respect. And you're not going to get respect from other people until first you're willing to give it to yourself. And when you do, you begin to realize those dynamics that Jean was talking about, the, the internal dimensions, the multidimensionality of who we have to be as people. The world that's falling apart is a reflection of who we have been and who we are. The world that's coming into being is a reflection of the people that we are becoming. And it's happening. And if you are open to it, it's all around you. But I think another thing that Jean was talking about today that's so important is enough with the kvetching, enough with the whining, enough with the bitching and the moaning. Sometimes I just have to sort of attitudinally just slap myself across the face, you know, just stop it, you know, just throw water in my face. Get over yourself. We have a world to save. And I do believe, as Jean said, that each and every one of us are coded with information that will illuminate our path and guide us towards our highest best use. And remember, as I was telling Jane how the Course in Miracles says, that the <coughs> people who have achieved the most on the planet have achieved a fraction of what each of us are capable of. All those brain cells that apparently we're not even using yet. Um, there is so much potential. So much potential not only in each of us, but there is so much potential in the world. And she, she talked in, in, in our conversation about imagining what the world could be. Imagine the, the oceans cleansed. Imagine the environment repaired. Imagine 
an economy that works for people. Imagine uh, agriculture as it could be and should be. Imagine the uh, uncorrupted food supply. Imagine uncorrupted water. Imagine people all over the world. Imagine the elimination of, of deep poverty. Imagine the elimination of war, as, as John F. Kennedy said. We will end war, or war will end us. When was the last time any of us even imagined a world without war? You know, and this worries me about a younger generation, too, because <clears throat> you now have young generations of Americans who never knew an America that wasn't at war. <sighs> this is a perpetual war machine, but we've still acquiesced to it because for too many of us, it's all we've ever known. And it's just this march towards destruction, a march towards global catastrophe that is, in too many ways, the unsurvivable future that now millions more people are waking up every day to say no to, a passionate no, a hell no, a rambunctious no, a rebellious no. That is the healthiest place to be right now because you find your no to what is not, not tolerable. It is not tolerable to you not on my watch, you find that, then the yes begins to become clearer. You don't wait till you know what the yes is to say that's not gonna work for me and that's not gonna work for my great-great-grandchildren. And you don't wait till you think you have something to give. You know, I've seen this in my life so many times. Don't wait till you think you have your life together to surrender it to the God of your understanding to be used for his purposes in healing the world. Give your life uh, to the creative, love, healing, repair source of the universe while it's still what you might think of as a mess. And that's when things really come together. Traditional Christians call that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that each of us have gifts that we're not yet actualizing because we have not yet placed them. We don't know them yet, so we have not placed them at s in service to the great healing of the world. Place yourself at service and your gifts will emerge. Thank you, Alyssa. And to all of you, if you have questions, write to me at marianne at castmedia.com. And don't forget to uh, uh, listen to the uh, uh, podcast on Apple and to rate it and to review. And I want to thank Amanda Elliott and Austin Kendrick and, and uh, Lauren Selsky and all of the people at Cast Media who are making this possible. I hope that our conversation with Jean today was of value to you. I hope you have a beautiful week. Until we meet again.